Hey everyone, and welcome to Biblical Bites. I'm Adam, and I'm excited to be your host alongside my co-host, Allison. Hi everyone, I'm Allison, and I couldn't agree with you more, Adam. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life in a fresh and relevant way, and to tackle everything and anything dealing with the church and the Bible today. So grab your Bible and your headphones and join us as we dive into the rich pages of Scripture, exploring its timeless truths and wisdom. In the process, we'll help fight against biblical illiteracy, empowering you to live out your faith with confidence and understanding. So let's journey together and deepen our knowledge and understanding of the Word of God. This is Biblical Bites. All right. Hey, Allison. Hey, I am Adam. so excited about this first episode, but honestly, I have to admit, I'm kind of nervous. Me too. <laughs> I don't know why. I think it's an anxious nervousness, maybe. Maybe so. I mean, I'm not sure if we're supposed to admit this, but we want to talk about truth That's on this true. podcast. So That's let's start true. with the truth. Well, and it's truth for real people. We want to be real. So well, let's face it. I need some reality when it comes to some of this uh, nervousness and anxiousness. But but uh, let's... Let's start here. Let's let's talk about uh, what we're doing, why we're doing this. So uh, just as a quick background, um, I, I don't even remember really how this occurred, but a couple of weeks ago or so, we kind of got on the topic of a podcast and uh, and I mentioned how uh, Alice and I, we have conversations often. Sometimes they're very spirited. Sometimes they're, uh, you know, just normal and boring for anybody else to want to listen to. But we thought and I thought that she would uh, really make a great podcaster. And uh, and if you want to take it from there, like yeah. what happened? Well, well, I tell you, when I told my daughter that we were going to do a podcast, she said, Mom, I don't think anybody wants to listen to y'all argue. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's you so know, true. So, sometimes we do have the spirited discussions. Yes. But I love that you have invited me to have a seat at the table. Absolutely. And, um, you know, biblical literacy and, and talking about the Bible, it's something that I've kind of always been interested in. Yeah. Um, have an English major in school. Mm. And so I was one of those nerds. That makes me more nervous. I think. <laughs> and so um, just as I've grown, God's given me opportunities um, to write. So I write children's curriculum for Lifeway, for mm. Explore the Bible and Gos- um, Gospel Project and Bible Studies for Life. And then um, open some doors to write for WMU. And as I've um, really gotten immersed into writing curriculum for kids in particular, I've noticed so much of what I thought and even so much of what I taught early on was maybe based on tradition Mm. more than it was based on the Bible. And so it's just given me a hunger to just kind of reach more into um, understanding the Bible for its meaning. And, mm. um, and so that's just kind of where I wanted to have that seat at the table and you offered that to me. And so we're just... yeah, I love that. I love that so much. I think, uh, I, I've always enjoyed, uh, your opinion and, and love listening to you talk about the Bible and teach the Bible. And we kind of share a lot of those, um, those same, uh, similar, similar interests, I should say, uh, in that, uh, and for me, this kind of became a, an opportunity for me to, um, given, uh, I don't know, like personally, testimony wise, I, I kind of grew up. Um, not in the church, uh, didn't discover church until I was probably like a freshman in high school or so, and, but just fell in love with it immediately. Just felt like I walked into a youth group of like 10 people and they were a bunch of like weirdos. And I was like, these are my people for some reason. I just, <laughs> I fell in love with it. Um, but I just remember from the, the, my youngest days of actually starting to read the Bible, I, I just didn't know what to do with it. I would read these stories and I felt so disconnected and I just, I could not help but feel like there was so much more to be discovered when it comes to this. And I think this is an intuition that a lot of people have about the Bible. Absolutely. Um, maybe not one they'd all admit, but you know, mo- even the ones who are seasoned church Bible studiers, um, I, I think that they probably will will come come to certain um, elements of of scripture, like talking donkeys and such, and and just don't quite know what this means or how it fits and stuff. And so um, I've I've been on a, a journey the past you know decade or so, um, trying to figure out what this is and how it is. I went and got a Bible degree, and nothing against institutions; they're great, they're amazing, but. I, I I walked away just kind of feeling like a bunch of facts were kind of thrown, you know, at me and um, it still didn't connect the dots. And so once I discovered kind of how this works and what the Bible's doing and stuff, um, it just it was like a I don't know, it's like all the pieces of the puzzle came together and now I desire to um to help other people along that discovery as well. And I love that because I was thinking about our podcast and us working together and I thought, you know, Adam 
is teaching my children <laughs> in the youth ministry, <laughs> and I'm teaching his three girls in the children's ministry. So we have a, have a vested interest that each other gets it right. That's right? absolutely true. In fact, that's something that I tell our youth all the time is that I, I'm, I'm probably one of the only youth pastors in the world that admit, you know, I... I don't much care for teenagers a lot of the time. In fact, I didn't even like being one most of the time. So, uh, but I do, I do love them and I understand that they'll be the ones that will one day have that opportunity to minister to my kids, kind of like what you're saying. So that, that I've vested an interest in those teenagers and for sure, uh, trust wholeheartedly in, in what you teach. You do a fantastic job. We have conversations with my kids all the time about, well, well I feel the same way about that. you. So I, I do appreciate that. So, um, yeah, you know, there's, there's, can we admit there that there's definitely an unfortunately there's an issue in the church today um it's kind of a big one unfortunately and um i think a lot of it has to do with biblical literacy um what do you think uh is it, why do you think that is why do you think that's an issue um in, anymore yeah and i've given that, given that a lot of thought and i've kind of come to three conclusions mm-hmm. that i think contribute to the problem of biblical illiteracy um the first one i think is we've kind of been really good Um, in establishing this expert amateur divide Mm. in the way that we teach the Bible. And what I mean by that is um, I'm going to sit under someone who's qualified to teach me and consume it. Mm. Now, there is absolutely a place for that. We know that the Bible teaches that there should be qualified elders, Mm -hmm. pastors, and corporate worship who are giving sound teaching to the church body. Mm. And we need to definitely receive that and sit under that. And that's very important. But then there should also be active learning circles within the church body mm. um, where we have the opportunity to participate in our learning. Mm. Um, you know, part of being a disciple is a student. Yeah. And um, and so I think so often we um, have kind of created these areas where we go and we sit um for an hour and listen to someone teach the Bible without a lot of participation. And the thing I think that has happened as a result of that is it's created the stigma that we need that. Yeah. That we need to be able to have someone teach us because we're not capable maybe mm. of understanding what it means on our own. And we know that's not true. Oh, yeah. That That is something that I've struggled with for a very, very long time is um, – even working in ministry, um, previous to having the degree um, in biblical studies, I've always struggled with the inadequacy part. Like, you know, I I don't kind of what you were saying, like, I don't feel like I have a seat at the table because I, I don't understand this enough. I don't I have a desire to. But because I don't have such and such label after, you know, my name and that kind of thing that people wouldn't listen anyways. Um, and then coupled with that internal struggle of like, I really don't understand how all this is fitting together. I have the generalized, shall I say, like Christian understanding that the Old Testament points to Jesus and then Jesus is the reason for the season, you know, yeah. uh, and then our kind of our response is now to go tell people, oh, Jesus, I got that and I understood that and I wanted to do that with my life. Um, but how do I start to fit all those pieces from Genesis all the way to Revelation? You know, how does this actually fit? You know, and how do I teach this responsibly? Kind of like what we were talking about with um, the Bible laying out those standards responsibly. Yeah. And I think as a teacher, it's our responsibility to do that. And um, what what do you think, we talked about when we started this podcast, um, we didn't want to just like kind of come about it like a negative thing. Right. Because I, th- I don't think there's anybody out there that won't, that will disagree with the fact that, yeah, w- the church is struggling um, a lot more than we probably need it to be. Um, and the systems that you're talking about I think that started in a good way. Absolutely. Um, I mean, for most of all of history, we've, the word has always been spoken, you know, the, you know, most of human history, the word has been spoken aloud. And so for us to sit under an individual who will speak it to us um, came naturally, you know, but now we live in an existence in a time where, I mean, there are ample amount of resources and Bible, Bibles out there just in print today. Um, And so, um, how, what, what are your thoughts that how does that fit into um, this this system or this worldview, this paradigm with regards to dealing with, um, you know, biblical illiteracy? You said you had three um, kind yeah. of three main so points. You, you kind of just paved the way for my second point. Oh, actually. perfect. And, and you're right. Have like that is a part of it. Having sound teaching that's spoken over you. <laughs> you know, God 
is a God of the word. If you think back to the Old Testament, um, you know, so many of the pagan religions, they centered around carved images or images of God. And God, from the beginning, he, he gave Moses what? He gave him the word. Yeah. And so we should be a people of the word. And, and part of that would be having the word spoken over you. And we do, like you said, have access more than ever to print Bibles, but we also are the more, most resourced generation in the yeah, world. In so other true. words, we have Bibles and then we have so many books yes. telling us what the Bibles mean. Yeah. And I think sometimes we get wrapped up in those resources mm -hmm. and we forget that we can and should first and foremost go directly to the word. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think there's kind of this devotional culture, hmm. you know, and it kind of goes back, I guess, to that expert amateur divide, having someone tell you, you know, what the Bible means. And I'm not dogging devotionals. Yeah, of course. Um, in fact, when my daughter, you know, kind of started um, on her journey of reading the Bible for herself, that's what we gifted her. Yeah. You know, it seems like a natural progression. But definitely there's something to be said for using the Bible as a primary source yeah. and those other resources maybe as aids to understanding after you've yes. read directly from the Word. Yes. Now, not knowing what your third point is, because we have not scripted this whole thing out. We wanted it to be conversational. Um, I, I would love to add to that because that is something that, um, that, that I'm very passionate about. Um, for me, again, speaking personally from a testimonial standpoint, um, I, I didn't I didn't know how to read the Bible. And because of that, I tried to listen to um, a million voices that were trying to show me how to read the Bible. But most of them, a lot of them were just more dealing with like, um, how does this Bible, you know, um, kind of what you're saying, the devotional mindset, how does this Bible um, inspire you to become more like these people that you're reading the Bible. And, and that's true. And, and, and I think that there's the Bible obviously has so much to offer, um, when it comes to, you know, that the ability to train and to, to, um, raise up and to change. But, um, I, again, I, I didn't understand cause I was reading it with certain, um, uh, foundations that I didn't realize were, were bad. And the problem with that is, is that when I, only look at the Bible like it's this devotional thing that this self-help guide, basically. Well, that doesn't differentiate the Bible. That doesn't differentiate the Bible from really the the greatest like genre of uh, other uh, writing out there in, in the self-help resources and stuff like that. And I and I if I'm going to stand and say that the Bible is something different and it's amazing, it's the most amazing thing out there, then then how do I how do I differentiate that? And then how does that fit into my paradigm when I read with that desire for it to change me? And I'm still doing like what Paul says, like I'm constantly doing all the things I know I shouldn't do. And I'm never doing the things I know I should do. So how do, how do I fit in? How does the, the word fit into that? Well, I think that really scripture can inform us of mm -hmm. that answer. You know, 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says that all scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching, mm -hmm. for reproof for correction mm -hmm. and for training in righteousness. And, you know, that's a lot of um, verbs, I yes. guess. And so yes. just to kind of explain what that means, um, you know, obviously the um, the teaching part, that's, that's pretty simple for mm -hmm. instruction. But for reproof, what does that mean? Well, so reproof means that something that can be tested mm. and stand mm. at the end of the day. And um, the correction part is like to bring you back upright, that's yeah. what that means, kind of in the original language, like you're just upside down yeah. and it just brings you right side up. Mm -hmm. And the training part just has to do with just being disciplined because mm -hmm. you are standing on something that can stand. Yeah. <laughs> and and so I think that um, that that's what makes, you know, the Bible different mm. is it's not that we want to increase biblical literacy so that we can understand. That's important, yeah. but it doesn't stop there. And it seems like, you know, with all other pieces of literature, um, you know, we read for understanding. Mm -hmm. Andrew's in fifth grade and he's having to read passages to yes. understand them and pass the test. Yeah. Um, but for us as Christians, when we approach the Bible, it's useful for all those things. And the ultimate goal is being literate to understand so we can obey. Mm. And so mm. it's that obedience part of it that really is the end goal of yeah. biblical literacy and what makes the Bible so different. Yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. Actually, I really like how you, how you uh, elaborated on that or uh, because you just kind of maybe 
purposefully, maybe unknowingly, you, you mentioned kind of like the second paradigm that people um, come to the Bible with it. The first one being like the self-help type thing. The second one is more like a like an encyclopedic, like resource type situation. Uh, it becomes like this is the way through which we gain understanding. Um, this is the thing that, the you know, did you have those? Did your parents have those like huge volume sets of encyclopedias yes. that they bought? Yeah. The man came to the door to sell them. Yes, exactly. Them. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the old days. That's what you had to do. Now you can just jump on Wikipedia and, you <laughs> sure. know, research anything at, at a moment. But uh, it becomes the way through which we have to um, discover like everything and get answers about this world, um, which, again, there's nothing wrong with that. Just like there's nothing wrong with the devotional mindset, but uh, but it, it still falls short of what the word also um, may offer and i think that if we were it's kind of like um this may be weird for for as an analogy but it's kind of like going to um work out you know at a gym and trying to like lift weights and and trying to gain a lot of muscles like if you've seen those memes or or the the statements like oh he he must have skipped leg day too many times you know you get this guy who's like super huge in bulk like in his you know upper body but his legs are like little chicken legs kind of thing um it's when you spend so much time trying to um, strengthen one aspect or one paradigm or worldview, um, the other ones become anemic. And and I think what you kind of what you were saying um, with biblical literacy for myself, it was trying to get the complexity of like all those worldviews. It is a reference manual, it is a devotional, you know, but it's also a relationship. Um, and I I think. Too often we neglect the relationship part. John 1 clearly claims that Jesus is the word, you know, and then taking that back through scripture and realizing like, uh, you know, even when I'm reading this stuff, it's more about purposefully spending time with your creator, with God, who will ultimately, like you were saying, kind of lead us to want to obey, um, obey in a way that we're going to build a deeper and more meaningful relationship and it's not that we have to go to every Bible study expecting that I'm going to get something out of that. That's not how you would approach speaking to, you know, your husband, Lance, every day. You don't go right. there and like, you know what, I'm only going to communicate with you so that I can figure out what I need to do better or so that I can get pure information from you. Like sometimes it's just spending time with Lance to de develop that deeper relationship. Sure. And you really your points bring me to kind of think of my third reason I think that we've kind of come to this place where we may consider our generation biblically illiterate, mm -hmm. you know, compared to other generations or other times. And I think it has to do with the way we approach scripture. Mm. And so like in our Western culture, um, it seems like we usually look for scripture first. And, and I hate to make a general stereotype, but, mm -hmm. you know, there are times we go to scripture and we look for um, what is this telling me about myself? What does this mean to me? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the scriptures were written and the original readers would have read them for the intent of it teaching first and foremost what this instructs me about God. Yeah. And I think that takes a little more work, mm -hmm. honestly, um, because, you know, I know myself. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I know my situation and I may be able to pick a scripture and immediately apply it to myself because mm -hmm. I'm so familiar with what I'm going through. But in order to take a scripture and look first and foremost about what that teaches me about God, then I have to know more about God. Mm. Um, for example, the thing that comes to mind is um, just kind of one scripture taken out of context a lot is like Philippians 4.13. Yeah. I can do all things through Christ right. who strengthens me, right? And, mean, and I don't want to throw I any stones. I win my football game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I have yep. quoted that scripture to my daughter before cheer trials. Okay, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens yep. me. Yep. So go do. And we somehow, you know, take that and we apply that to what we're going through, or particularly like if, um, you know, you're praying that over a football team, well, um, you know, that scripture can't, can't really be applied in that way because we know from other scriptures that God doesn't show partiality. Yeah. And so um, we need to look and see, think, well, what is this teaching me about mm -hmm. God? Um, and we know that the context of that scripture is that Paul was going through a terrible time yeah. and he was learning to be content in what God had. It's sort of working the opposite of how exactly, we generally right? use it. Yeah. But, you know, being able to really understand that scripture for its intent requires us to know something about the character of God. Yes. And it's, you know, it takes a little more attention and time yep. um, to to be able to approach scripture and learn first and foremost what it's informing us about God, yeah. not so much what it's informing us about ourselves, which will be an outpouring 
boring. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're going to be instructed by it. But first and foremost, what is this teaching me about God? Yes. Yeah. So there's two things that come to mind when you talk about that is uh, that trope that, that you hear often that the Old Testament God versus the New Testament God, there seems to be a difference there. It mm-hmm. seems like the Old Testament God is an angry, wrathful God. And the New Testament God is like, you know, it's the, you know, hippie, Jesus loving right. God, you know. Um, but but unless you're in the word and like you were saying, intentionally discovering that relationship, that who who the character of God actually is, it could come across that way. But that's just taking Philippians 4.13 out of context. You're actually missing the wholeness of, of Scripture, the, the completeness of Scripture, the complete uh, revelation of, of who God actually is. And, uh, and, um, and so for me, helping to bridge some of those gaps to say, hey, look, number one, I, Actually, the way that we approach scripture, trying to, like you were saying, um, get the I, I, I part out of it. When you do that, um, you're actually kind of falling into the trap that that the Bible is sort of setting for you. You know, there's a reason why we look at the the Israelites a lot of times in the Old Testament and we go, man, these guys were so, so dumb sometimes. Excuse my phrasing. You know, they were they were they you know, wandered on a dry ground, you know, through the Red Sea in this miraculous event, but almost immediately or, or telling Moses, like, we should be back in Egypt, you know, and you're just like, this seems, they seem so like silly. Like if we were there, we wouldn't have that problem. But you're falling into that trap because the completeness of scripture to show that, no, there are none righteous. There will never be the ones who can do it humanly until God himself will come humanly and do it. You know, and so um, the seeing the I in scripture and w- the way that I always like to put it is like we sort of always read ourselves as the hero <laughs> trope, you know. Meanwhile, the Bible's really, really, really good at showing the hero is a lot of times the anti hero um, because it's going to necessitate the one who will be the hero, you know. Um, and so, um, kind of getting that completer, the more completer. Is that a word? I don't think so. Hey, it sounds good. English major, <laughs> not an English major. Uh, the complete view um, will help in that um, development. And then when you do that and you discover the wholeness of God, that that changes you as an individual unintentionally because it's no longer this misunderstanding or anemic understanding of who God is, but you're getting a better view of who your Savior is and who and how you fit into this piece, which just it blows my mind that God still wants to partner with us, even though we're constantly trying to like sway things off course and lead things back into chaos um, unnecessarily. Right. And you bring up a, such a good point, you know, like this idea that there's an Old Testament God mm. and a New Testament mm. God. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I have really learned and, and tried to embrace in my teaching and my writing is the meta narrative of the mm-hmm. scripture. And I know that's a really big word, but it just means that overarching story. Yes. There is an overarching story mm-hmm. to the Bible and the New Testament is best read through the lens of the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all of the ways that um, the Lord fulfills. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, I think the way that I really underst- understand it, the way that it was best ex- explained to me one time was that each each story or each book is valuable mm-hmm. in and of itself. Um, it's like a pearl. Yeah. But when you put the pieces together, when you put those pearls together, it forms a pearl necklace, mm. which is so much more valuable and useful. Yes. And um, and so I think it's so important to approach the Bible as one story. Mm. And, um, you know, we're really good um, about reading those smaller books, yeah. like looking at James and yeah. Paul's letters, you know, because we can kind of bite them off in a way that. Um, we can accomplish it, but you know we probably haven't spent as much time studying mm-hmm. Leviticus yeah, or right. um, those kinds of books. But you know they're really equally important. Yes. And so, um, what would you say to someone who's like, well, you know, I just I don't really know that I am biblically literate based yeah. on what you guys are talking about. Well, first of all, I would say it's okay. Really, none of us are. There's never a point in which we, we're going to get to like, ah, we made it. You know, um, you can talk to any PhD in theology person out there and they're never going to admit 
no, I've, I've got this down, right? Because they're always going to be in that process of discovery forever. That's why in Psalm, actually one of the passages I, I love is in uh, Psalm 1. And it just talked about the blessed man, the blessed man who walks not in the counsel of wicked but, and doesn't stand in the way of sinners, doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law, the Torah, the teachings of the Lord. And on this law, he meditates day and night. And for me, I always felt very disconnected from that. Like, how do I meditate on this day and night? I'm, I'm supposed be doing like yoga poses and you know just having scripture read through my mind and no uh, for me uh what i've discovered is that it just means that you've allowed this through spending time there through through um seeking out and searching who god is and looking at that whole meta narrative it becomes the thing that you dwell on um naturally you know it like for instance one of the things that um that once once I've kind of been given this opportunity, God's given me the opportunity to sort of teach more and more people about kind of what I've been seeing as far as kind of connecting the dots between those meta narratives. And I have, a, if anybody who knows me, like I love the the Old Testament, which if you would have talked to me, you know, five years ago, I'd have been like, I don't know what to do with the Old Testament. Leviticus is like no clue, right? But yesterday I had the opportunity to go to our um, local high school's first priority uh, at Port Natchez. And um, uh I taught a whole lesson on on two genealogies in, in the book of Genesis. And I told him up front, I was like, look, this is going to seem absolutely random, but I promise you if you stick through this, it's going to you, – you'll start to see things differently. And I'm telling you, those kids were into it. Like they – <laughs> I got a text later that was like, I, th that was kind of strange. Like, I can't believe we really, I mean, all of them were taking pictures of the whiteboard. Cool. <laughs> like, they were, this is so cool. I've never seen this before. But we've we've lost sight of how to read that. And it's not anyone's fault necessarily. It's just we've kind of, our na nature is to kind of go about it the simple way. And unfortunately, we've taken and we've skipped leg day too long. You know, um, in fact, I would even say in that, in that we've skipped our left arm day too. So we may be really <laughs> strong on one side, but we forget all the other parts of that Timothy passage that you're talking about. So we have some who are really good at correcting, mm -hmm. you know, some who are really good at, at teaching, but, but we're missing the ground in between and we've segmented and we've made this um, even more difficult to attain. And so um, when it comes to what do you do, you know, when you feel like you're biblically illiterate, number one, take the pressure off. Mm -hmm. These are just fancy words. I think for me, it's biblical illiterate, biblical literacy. It just means like, are you purposely spending time with Jesus? Jesus is considered the word like John one says, you know? And so Trust that 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 by purposefully choosing to spend time with Jesus, that he, that things will start to fall into place. And I, that's been my testimony as well. Um, when you seek, like Jesus says this often too, like when you're looking and you're seeking and you're wanting, to, He'll reveal those things. Like the, it'll be open that when you knock, the door will be open. You know. Um, but He also says that, hey, um, well, what is that passage? I don't have it in my mind right now, but the passage where he's talking to is talking to the crowd and he's te teaching in a parable. Um, and his uh, disciples are like, w why do you keep teaching in these parables? Like, why can't you just tell us in plain in sight? And his, his response is uh, right now I teach you in these parables in this, in these hidden manners, because one day it'll be very clear, but it's going to force you to, to sort of meditate on those things day and night um, to discover it. You know, um, and I'm increasingly convinced that the the surface level reading of things, while great, because I think it can accomplish things just like a self-help book, surface level reading can can um, accomplish things. I'm, I increasingly believe that the more and more you are willing to dig into those things, the more and more that's revealed when it comes to God's character and, and what's actually important, those kind of things. Absolutely. And I love that you say, I love two things you said. I Good. love that you say that, uh, <laughs> yes. that your students were eager mm. because, you know, I've really experienced that in my circles mm. as well, you know, primarily teaching women and children. And um, I just I, I love my ladies Bible study. Mm. I just love the ladies. And we're just digging in sometimes in new ways and they are not resistant. Yes. And, and I love that. So I do see that eagerness. But I also love how you said, um, take the pressure off. Yeah. You know, I'm a mom. I have two mm. kids. I have a, a daughter who's 17 and a, a young man who's 10, thinks mm. he's 18. <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, mom guilt is a real thing. Yeah. Um, and and not just so not just for my personal life, but, you know, I, for those sometimes when I listen to these podcasts and I listen to like a problem identified, I think, oh, 
this is another thing I'm doing wrong. Yeah. This is another thing I need to add to my to-do list. And and really, biblical literacy should not be yeah. approached in that way. And I think, I remember when I taught exercise at the gym, we had a trainer come in and um, kind of keep up our, our credits, our, our certified, you know, credentials and things. And he told us that when we saw clients walking on the treadmill flat, that we should go and encourage them to spend that you, that time on the treadmill at a slight incline yeah, and they would accomplish them more. In fact, his, his saying stuck with me, uh, walk flat, stay fat. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, oh. but you know, in a way that can kind of be applied to biblical literacy yeah. in that um, it might take a little more attention. Mm. It might take, um, you know, stretching yourself a little bit to read um, in a way that's kind of looking at the author's intent, maybe instead of just trying to apply it to your situation, but it shouldn't, it's not unattainable. Absolutely. And not. it's not something that, um, you know, we should add to our to-do list in this drudging way. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think as I've grown a little bit older, um, I grew up in that era where you had a quiet time. Quiet times are great. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for us in youth group growing up, you know, we were like, it was kind of promoted like you get up and you spend the first 15 minutes of your day yes. in the Bible. And, and my daughter still does that. And I'm thankful for that because it establishes the discipline Absolutely. for the word. And so there's yep. value in that. But I think when we make it this box to check off that sometimes we may be missing what the Lord has for us. And so mm -hmm. in my life right now, in this season, I'm just going to rock your world. I don't read the Bible every day all the time. Oh, my goodness. Right? How Sometimes dare you? Sometimes <laughs> I, I go two days Scandal. without reading it, and then I sit down for an hour, yeah. and I dig into it. And for me, that seems to be more profitable when I'm reading for understanding. Yeah. Um, and so I think we need to kind of, like, unleash ourselves, you yeah. know, from these expectations and from this guilt, because um, I've seen an eagerness like you. Yep. And, and it's attainable. In fact, I was just looking at some of Andrew's homework and, um, you know, he's doing some reading practice for that star test coming oh, up. Because in Texas, we take the star test. And um, I looked at his teaks and I'm thinking, you are equipping my child in public school to be literate in the Bible. Because these things that we're teaching kids that mm -hmm. you probably learned about identifying the purpose. Yeah. Um, identifying imagery using i mean these are all things that we can apply to reading the bible i mean yep. seriously like if you just look at the teaks you'll be like if if we would just read the bible in this way the teaks are like the standards yeah. for what they teach our kids in school if we could just apply this to reading the bible but somehow we've like had this disconnect that the bible is a piece of literature because mm -hmm. we we think that's like minimizing it and it's more than that but it's not less than that yes it is a piece of literature and we can read it um, you know, with trying to understand, because the author did have one intent mm. in the Bible, and we can read it looking for that intent using the tools that we learned as fifth graders. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, 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 how, how do I say that? The pressure, the, we, we have, a, we, I say this often, actually, um, you can trust your intuition when it comes to scripture, Um in, I'm sure at later podcasts we'll kind of get down some of the the things that I've noticed when it comes to especially sp specifically reading the Old Testament because that seems to be the one that people disconnect the most as far as that goes. So we we can talk about that later. But as as I start to kind of teach these things that help us to become more aware of like how this is working, like you said, the, we understand the Bible's literature. But what's ironic about that is we we place it into categories that that um, cause us to read it as the wrong type of literature, if I should say that, um, which that's a hot topic between us two. Are we getting two. into the no, discussion no, no, of no, genre? No, 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 that's not, we, not genre. Okay. That's not what I mean. What I mean is like we, our intuition is to see it as literature, but we, but we stop shy of um, the type of literature it is and how to read this literature, which makes us feel disconnected. It's kind of like whenever we read um, like Shakespeare, you know, um, I, I, I quit all sports in high school and went into acting and theater and stuff. And and uh, and so this is right up my alley. Um, Shakespeare is so confusing to me. I don't understand it. It's difficult for me to read. But 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 there's no denying that he was some sort of genius when it comes to this kind of thing. But. I can I can associate Shakespeare with a certain type of literature and stuff, but because I don't have the the right tools or the right mindsets that maybe even the author had, um, uh, Shakespeare himself, in this case the biblical authors have, um, it's going to force me to fill in gaps um, that that aren't meant to be filled in there. 
Um, and so, but our intuition is still there, yeah. you know, and what I've noticed is once people start to kind of see what the Bible's doing, um, and I, I kind of force them into that training part where they're, I'm not going to give you an answer like a lecture, but we're going to talk this through. And I want you to kind of come to that. Their intuitions are there. Now, maybe the conclusions are off sometimes, but that that's that's where the work comes in. That's where spending, a, a, you know, a lifetime meditating and stuff like that and realizing that we're not going to come to all the conclusions. And that's OK, right? because um, it's just it's profitable to be spending time with the creator. And one day, you know, it'll be clear to us. But the things that aren't clear to us, we we don't have to split hairs over because that was never the point. Absolutely. Keep the main <laughs> things, the plain things and the yeah. plain things, the main things. That's a T-shirt. That's good. Yeah. I like and, that. and I have a name for that intuition. Yeah. The Holy Spirit. Oh, imagine that. I, I mean, right. The spirit leads us into all truth. Imagine and that. so that does yeah. make the Bible different from other pieces of literature yep. and that the spirit is our teacher. Yeah. I wish the Holy Spirit was there to help me with Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so true. That's a yeah. really that's a really good point. And so I think for those who maybe just want to kind of like, OK, I'm interested. You know, you, mm. you've got my juices flowing. How do I become biblically literate? Um, I would say start in Genesis. Mm. Um, really? And, yeah. OK. And, All uh, right. You probably have a study Bible. I think you told mm. me before we started taping that, what, there's six billion in circulation yeah, in the world there, today? There are a number. Let's see. Bibles sold per year. On average, there are 100 million Bibles printed each year, and it's projected that there are over 6 billion Bibles currently that are in print. That's 140% more than the estimated 2.5 as of 1975's okay. count. So since 1975 here, we've increased the amount of Bibles that have been printed and are in circulation each year by 140%. So we have access to a good study Bible. A little Bible. bit. I a think little so. bit, yeah. So I would say get a study Bible. Mm. Um, it, it'll say study Bible, you yeah. know, on the yeah. cover. And, um, and don't skip the introduction page. Mm. Mm. Don't skip the introduction page to the book. And you know what page I'm talking about. I'm talking yeah. about the page that starts right little before chapter sheet. one. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's going to tell the author. It's going to tell probably the purpose. It's going to tell the style mm -hmm. of writing the genre. And they give some historical information mm. about maybe when the book was written or um, perhaps, you know, what time period it's covering. Like, for example, a lot of times we don't realize that John, the book of John, was the last of the four Gospels mm. written, uh, like several decades mm -hmm. after the other um, letters or Gospels, excuse me, were written. And it deals, it, it, John had couple decades to look at how they were dealing with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Yeah, yeah. And he addresses some unique things, and that can be helpful. Yeah. You know, we're reading, having some of that background information. But get a study Bible, read the first page, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then begin reading, you know, the text. For me, um, I read the Bible chronologically, you mm. know, Bible yeah. reading plan. And, and there are a lot of Bible reading plans that, and they're all, I'm sure, have their benefits. Sure. But for me... It really helped me to get a chronological Bible mm -hmm. reading plan because it, I needed that like timeline. I was so confused about like who lived when and when this happened yeah. in relation to other events. And so that really helped me um, to read, you know, the Bible just in the order that it occurred yeah. in history. And um, and I would say that would be this the first steps and, and not be afraid to ask the questions of those yeah. texts that are yeah. natural. Um, so I have two things to add to that. Um I would look at it slightly, slightly different um, for it. And, and of course, it depends on where you are in your in your faith journey. So if for if dealing with somebody who may be fresh into this and I, I know that you would agree with this, so this isn't me disagreeing with you. Yeah. If you're fresh into it and you're like, I've just never, ever had any sort of a Bible thing at all. Um, I would start in the New Testament book of John, like what you're saying. Um, I think it's really well crafted and it's done. It's it's done really well to help um ease you into this idea that Jesus is somebody special, that there was a point behind what Jesus was doing and that it, it, there was a divine purpose behind who Jesus was and what he was doing. Um, and that, that, that's a lot coming from me. Cause if anybody knows me, I love the book of Genesis. I, if I just could spend forever in the book of Genesis. So um, <laughs> I, I enjoy Genesis. Um, but if you're fresh into this, Genesis is, is, can be daunting because it's, it is, it's it's very disconnected from what we think we understand and know about the world. Um, and so by the time you get to these, you know, two humans and a talking snake, it can sort of feel 
um, disconnected in a, in a way. And so um, there's certain elements there. But if you're reading that through the, if you're far in your faith journey, then then reading Genesis through the eyes through an eye through the eyes of um, what Jesus was going to accomplish and how he accomplished it, and this is kind of the setup to that. Then then yeah, I think that's a very very helpful way. Um, but also, I I do want to um, uh, kind of drive home that th- there isn't a right way. The only right way is um, is is just recognizing that problem and and beginning to um you know take steps towards that right direction so if you open the bible to james and that's where you feel led to read or if you do a one-year timeline or however that may be the the word doesn't return void so you're always going to accomplish something um and so don't feel the pressure of going like i don't know what to do once i get to leviticus right (laughs) you know or something like that uh that's okay that you know that's where those awesome resources are and actually, um, one resource that I think is incredibly helpful, no matter what um, area uh, of your faith walk or faith journey you are, is um, the Bible Project. I'm a huge um, proponent of the Bible Project. They have an app out there that has reading plans and ha- and kind of has you know various levels of depth and complexi- complexity and, and teaching and stuff like that. And so that's that's one free other resource that I I, I really love. Absolutely. And they have those great videos that are yes. like almost like cartoons for adults, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> I'm constantly utilizing children's mm. um, curriculum and resources for kids um, in my own faith walk. Yeah. Because I feel like if it was written for a child to understand that, yeah. I can understand it too. And there's so many good, accurate ones yes. um, available. Well, actually, I think statistics show that most uh, adult Christians, um, they they don't generally go past like the children's book knowledge of the Bible a lot of times. So, so um, there's there's some positive there. Um, and so uh, I didn't mean that as that probably sounded negative. That's not what I meant. Uh, I just mean that um, there's obviously foundation, you know, that that you you see there. And I, I watch those videos all the time. So yeah. I love them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good. So how do we end this? <laughs> I mean, I feel like this could this conversation just could go on right, and on. So right. it's kind of difficult to end. Yes. But, you know, I would want to end just on a positive note, like yeah. we talked about, you know, because it, it's not our goal to make anyone feel guilty. Yes. You know, um, it's not it's not our place to convict. You know, that's the spirit's place to convict. But on top of that, it's not hopeless. Yes. Um, And I think that with kind of this, I guess, problem that we've identified where we're, you know, maybe biblical literacy is not where it should be. We could look at that as a problem. We could look at it as an opportunity. Yes. And um, I know you've seen this in your circles and I've seen this in my circle that um, people are hungry Mm -hmm. for something to stand on. Yes. That lasts the test of time. Yeah. And um, the Bible offers that. Mm. And and not offers that just for non-Christians. Obviously, if you're an unbeliever, you know, that is our source of hope. Yes. But, you know, there are even believers that, you know, and, and me being one of them, particularly in certain seasons, and where I just, I need something to hold on to. Yep. And, and really becoming more and more biblically literate helps us to know God yep. more and more. And really gives us something to hold on to. And that starts with his word because that's how he has revealed himself yes. to us is through his word. And so um, instead of looking at this as a problem, I hope that it can be an opportunity Yeah, because I sense a willingness yes. among the church. Mm-hmm. And that to me excites me beyond measure that there is such a willingness. Um, and so I hope that our listeners would just embrace the opportunity Yes, um, to just get to know God better through his word by making it a priority, being willing to ask questions, mm. being willing to look at it for themselves. Yeah. And um, and I, I have no doubt there will be growth in so many areas as a result of that. Absolutely. In fact, I, I think uh, coming to that point where we can humble ourselves and say, look, we th- there is a problem. There may be a problem in in my own personal life, um, but you're not alone in this. Like it, it it's it's a, a vast problem, and knowing that there's a a willingness and and um, hunger to want to overcome that problem. Uh, I'd like to just kind of um, maybe we can end on this if you want. But yeah. um, uh, I wanted to bring up in John chapter 17. Um, this is um, considered the high priestly prayer. This is the prayer that Jesus is going to have um, in in his alone time with the Father previous to his death. And you know, you know what he prays for? 
What? He prays for unity. Yeah. And check check out what he says in this passage, John chapter 17, starting in verse uh, 14. He says, I've given them to your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify, that's a fancy word for set them apart, in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. And so Jesus prays that, that we will be unified in, in a mission and in a mindset and to continue um, as that image of, of God in this world and, and to do that foundationally together in truth, in his word. And so um, that's, that's, that's my heart. I believe that's your heart as well Absolutely. is to, to help, help kind of uh, deal with some of those things. So th- this podcast, um, it, it's kind of a, a mishmash of a bunch of type of things. We may deal at times with cert- with topics, um, mm-hmm. specific topics um, that may be relevant to the church today. We may deal with specific, maybe even just Bible studies or specific times in the word. Um, I don't know. What, what do you, is there anything that yeah. You can foresee this kind of going down. We're kind of open at this point. I mean, I just feel like we've kind of like set the stage for just being the church's cheerleaders. Yes. I mean, I just, like it. just cheering on the church. That's great. Um, because, you know, they, they there's a willingness and, and we yes. certainly don't have the, all the answers. No, so we wouldn't characterize no. ourselves as as the church's teachers. No. As much as just, um, you know, cheering on our brothers and sisters with love and charity mm. And um and just kind of walk in the walk together. That's that's wonderful. Uh, I'll tell you what. Could I uh, maybe close this podcast out with a prayer? Absolutely. All right. Let's pray. Father God, um, we understand that you are the author of all things. God, that that your word is a is a lamp uh, into our feet onto our path. God, and we pray that we will um we will we will be willing, God, to let this go wherever you want it to go. Father God, I pray that we can, um, if if it so be, that you will open up um, the right doors, the right, um, put this in front of the right people who will find encouragement in this. But God, that they won't stop um, with this podcast, but they will begin to open up um, their word and, and begin to see things and, and, and reveal things about who you are and what you've done for us um, in, a, in a new way, in a fresh way that you will, um, in, in uh in David's words, that you will restore to us the, the joy of our salvation, God, and that it will just become so much a part of us that it will begin to um, overflow, and we won't be able to um, to conceal that in our own times, but that it'll pour out into our families and our friends and our workplaces. Um, Father, we just ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.